Hello, everyone, and welcome to this month's edition of the Seekers Forum. I hope you're having a great weekend. And let's say hi to Jay Cobley. Hi, Jay. Hello, Mark. Good to see you. Good to see you, too. Welcome. So this month, we are looking at uh, spontaneous healing, what it is and what it is not. Now, we've all heard rumors of so-called miracle cures, and some of us may have even experienced our own or witnessed them in somebody else. You know, those recoveries that don't make sense, that beat the odds, that leave doctors scratching their heads and wondering what happened. Those healings that came about through better nutrition or lowering stress, through spiritual practice, through being treated by so-called miracle workers. There are thousands of well-documented cases of such healings that have been studied over the course of several decades. There are also, of course, a huge number of bogus reports of spontaneous healing by charlatans, by con artists, and snake oil salesmen that come with no proof whatsoever and are easily disproved when you look at them closely. Now, just as an informed, open skepticism is advisable when seeking a teacher, as we were talking about last month, The same can be said when it comes to healing, where health practitioners can easily exploit and manipulate people who are sick and desperate to get better. Dr. Andrew Weil, who's one of the pioneers in the field of integrative medicine, reminds us that the word doctor comes from the Latin word for teacher. According to Weil, teaching prevention should be the primary function of doctors, showing people how not to get sick in the first place. The secondary function is to treat an existing disease. As he puts it, we do not have a health care system in America. We have a disease management system that depends on ruinously expensive drugs and surgeries that treat health conditions after they manifest, rather than giving our citizens simple diet, lifestyle, and therapeutic tools to keep them healthy, unquote. We forget that an elaborate healing system exists in the body. A system that repairs wounds, renews bone, strengthens our immunity, and also corrects mistakes that creep into our DNA blueprint that, if left unattended, can result in cancer and other diseases. Unfortunately, the body's built-in healing system receives very little attention from many mainstream doctors who have been trained to look for pathologies. And yet, as this month's guest interview, Dr. Jeffrey Rediger, makes very clear, the vast majority of diseases are lifestyle related. And still, the role of the mind in the healing process is almost completely disregarded. Those of us who've had serious health issues know that the quality of the practitioner-client relationship is central to the healing process. And yet, how few of our doctors ask us about our lifestyle? What's your stress level? Do you sleep? What do you eat? What are your relationships like? Do you have a spiritual life? None of that is ever a part of a medical intake. Also, there's a phenomenon known as the placebo response, which I'm sure you've heard about, when healing is elicited by the mind. You know, it's no surprise that the medical establishment is so slow to incorporate placebo as well as other healing modalities into its therapeutic interventions because doctors are trained to be the authorities and most of them don't like to be questioned or presented with evidence that contradicts their scientific models. As one AIDS patient told me many years ago, he said, quote, sometimes they don't even want you to get better. They need you to go on the path you're supposed to go on. You're supposed to be here for 18 months and then die. So don't get off that bed. Don't get out of that box, unquote. Now, let me be clear. I'm not denigrating doctors. Most doctors are dedicated people doing the best that they can within a limited system. But we do need to pay attention to the research that shows how implicit bias, for example, shapes physician behavior and produces differences in medical treatment and outcomes based on the doctor's own beliefs. Jeff Rediger, who is one of the foremost researchers in this field, is very candid about his own skepticism regarding non-medical healing. In fact, when people started to come to him 20 years ago with stories and documentation about getting better spontaneously, he admits that his first response was not to look at the data. He did his best to resist the proof before him because it scared him. 
It challenged his authority and it also set him up for a professional mockery. But in the end, as a scientist as well as a seeker, he couldn't turn away from the growing evidence that his medical training had left out a great deal and he needed to check it out for himself. It turned out that the evidence he was getting was incontrovertible. There was a young man in Colorado who had been diagnosed with stage four brain cancer, who began chemotherapy and radiation after the surgery, but decided that he didn't want to spend the last months of his life in misery, and so he stopped. At a friend's suggestion, he moved to a healing center and began a regimen of spiritual exploration and meditation. Two years later, an MRI showed that his tumor was gone. Then there was a physician in Ohio who had a biopsy that revealed idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, which is an irreversible disease that always ends in death. She was weak and exhausted. She had to go on disability. She had to walk around with a CPAP machine to get oxygen. She began to see a physician who was also a faith healer, and he gave her acupuncture and he began to pray over her. She says she began to feel stronger. She was able to give up the oxygen and eventually go back to work. And a couple of years later, a chest x-ray showed no evidence that she had ever had the disease. And finally, there was the woman that Rediger met in Oregon who learned that she had pancreatic cancer, which is one of the deadliest and, and quickest killing cancers. She refused the risky surgery that her doctors offered her, and she decided to live her remaining months as well as she could among friends and family and doing what she loved. Five years later, a CAT scan showed that her pancreas was clean. Now, although these cases are rare, the fact that they happen at all opens up a whole range of questions and possibilities that do need to be investigated. According to Rediger, there is in fact no such thing as a miracle cure. What we call miracles are things that happen for which we have no ready explanation. If we understood how the laws of the universe actually work, we would understand that these things are happening according to laws that fall outside the limits of our current science. The other thing that Rediger says is that there's nothing spontaneous about spontaneous healing. In every single case that he studied, he found that people who refused conventional treatment had nevertheless made important changes in their lifestyles. He tells a story in the book about a woman who was given a year to live, which gave her permission to quit the job she hated, to leave toxic relationships that were driving her crazy, to move to more natural surroundings, to begin a spiritual practice. She ended up healing, not because it was a miracle, but because she had created the conditions for healing in her life. And this is the important point. When we create the conditions for healing in our lives, many things are possible that defy logic and defy doctor's diagnoses. These conditions that we create around for healing in our lives and our bodies fall into a few key categories. Some of them are very obvious, but they're still worth looking at. The first one, of course, is the physical. Watching our diet, exercise, our, our being in an environment that is healthful, all of the things that we tend to think lead to good health are important to keep in mind, including sleep. Sleep is a big one that gets overlooked. Apparently, research shows that one third of the people studied in this country, adults studied, were severely sleep deprived. So the physical is obvious and very important. The next is the effect of the emotions on healing. We understand now that things like guilt and shame and anger can have a terribly deleterious effect on the body over a long period of time. So it's important to be aware of our emotional life. What's going on in there? And when we don't understand what's going on, it's important to gain insight into what's going on in whatever way we can. You know, whether it is meditation, whether it's therapy, whether it's journaling or doing the kind of writing that we do in the Seekers Forum, writing for self-inquiry. All of these things help us to identify our emotional states and to clear up places where we are blocked or hurting ourselves or other people. The next is to look at our social lives. Who do we socialize with? What are the qualities of those relationships? Are they wholesome? Are they supportive relationships? Do we feel a sense of community and belonging? These are all quite important. Next is spirituality. Having some kind of a spiritual life, it doesn't matter what it is, 
it's entirely subjective. It has to speak to you, but it needs to connect to a force that's larger than we are and goes beyond the body-mind and our own thinking. The next quality for creating healing in our lives is intellectual. You know, we need to keep the brain stimulated. So whether it's doing crossword puzzles, whether it's reading, whether it's learning new things, taking extension courses, being in a group like the Seekers Forum, keeping the mind alert leads to healthy and healthful outcomes. And the last two are a little less obvious, particularly this one. Our financial state has a lot to do with the healing or lack of healing that happens in our lives because finances, of course, are one of the primary sources of stress for many, many people. So we need to not live beyond our means. We need to have a sense that what we are doing is sufficient to support us and also to have a sense that the money we are making and how we make it is a livelihood that even if it isn't full of great meaning for us, it needs to not be against our values. Sometimes a job is just a job, but when a job contradicts who we are, what matters to us, then it can actually become quite harmful. And the last point is environmental. And I touched on that a little bit earlier. What's the quality of our home life? You know, or do we live in clutter? Do we live in dirt? Are we connected to the larger community and taking care of our neighborhoods? These are also important questions to ask when it comes to creating a healing atmosphere in our lives. Now, the most important component to healing is finding a doctor or a healthcare professional to guide and support us. There is an abundance of research that confirms that the patient-clinician relationship affects medical outcomes in a major way. For a doctor-patient relationship to be healing, there needs to be an empathic connection, first of all, an assumption at the core of the relationship that the doctor wants your well-being above everything else that they see you, that they hear you, there's space for your input and your questions. Knowing this creates an expanded sense of wellness and hope. Fear is replaced by trust. Now, when it comes to so-called spontaneous healing, the next most important point is the placebo effect, which I mentioned earlier. And I'd like to look more deeply at what the placebo effect is and how it helps us. This is very, very important. In medicine, a placebo is a substance or other treatment that appears to be a medical intervention, but isn't one. In other words, the healing effects of placebo can't be attributed to the properties of the placebo itself and must therefore be due to the patient's belief in the treatment. It turns out that belief is the oldest medicine known to man. Placebo studies, which have only begun really in the last 15 years in earnest, are forcing scientists to look at what is usually not paid attention to in medicine, as we've been saying, which is that the effect of the thoughts and the feelings on our medical conditions, the direct interface of psychology and biology. When it comes to the placebo effect, there are many varieties. There isn't just one placebo effect. So let me just tell you about a few of the different kinds to keep an eye out for. First, there's something called regression to the mean. When people first go to the doctor with their symptoms, they might be feeling particularly sick. But in the natural course of an illness, symptoms may get better on their own. In depression clinical studies, for example, researchers found that around one third of patients get better without drugs or placebo. In other words, time itself is a kind of placebo that heals. The next placebo effect is called confirmation bias. For example, a patient may hope to get better when they're in treatment, so they change their focus. They'll pay closer attention to signs that they are getting better and ignore signs that they're getting worse. This glass half full approach to health can become a self-fulfilling prophecy. The next placebo effect concern expectations and learning. Researchers suggest that the placebo response is something that we learn via cause and effect. For example, we get cues about how we should respond to pain and medicine from our environments. Studies show that post-operative patients whose painkillers are distributed by a hidden robot pump at an undisclosed time need twice as much drug to get the same pain-relieving effect as when the drug is injected by a nurse that they can see. Isn't that amazing? This means that awareness that you're being given something that's supposed to relieve pain 
impacts the perception of it working. The same holds true for fake surgeries, where doctors make some incisions but don't actually change anything. Fake surgeries are an even stronger placebo than pills. In one systematic review of surgery placebos, the fake placebos, it found that fake surgeries led to improvements 75% of the time. 75% of the time, the doctor has done absolutely nothing and people improve. Another placebo effect is connected to pharmacological conditioning. There have been studies, for example, on Parkinson's patients, where for several days, the patient will be on a drug to fight pain or to deal with the symptoms of the disease. When the doctor surreptitiously switches the patient over to a placebo, they continue to feel the healing effects. In other words, just like Pavlov's dogs who learn to associate the sound of a bell with food and start to salivate in anticipation, our brains learn to associate taking a pill with relief and start to produce the brain chemicals that kickstart that relief. And finally, connected to this is the final placebo effect, which is social learning. You know, when study participants observe a treatment working on someone else, they have a greater placebo response than when they are just hooked up to the machine and haven't seen anyone. So together, these placebo effects comprise a kind of a healing curriculum you could say. so, and, and we need to pay attention to how these forces affect us in our lives, particularly when we're not well physically. There are a couple of other things that are worth mentioning regarding placebo. And first is, it's always been assumed that patients needed to not know that the pill or the surgery was fake for it to work. But it turns out that's not the case. Randomized controlled trials found that giving patients open label placebos improved symptoms of certain chronic conditions such as irritable bowel, lower back pain, chronic fatigue, depression, in ways that no known treatments do. And the second is that there's something known as the nocebo effect. And that's when negative expectations make people feel worse. Some researchers are suggesting that it's actually what's fueling the gluten-free diet fad. Now, of course, many people are actually gluten-free. Some people have celiac disease. It's very simple. I'm not being glib. But it's also true that people who have developed a negative expectation that eating gluten will make them feel bad do, in fact, suffer from gluten, even though they may not have any biological gluten sensitivity. So the overarching point here is that understanding the body-mind connection is showing us that healing is possible in ways that we've barely begun to imagine. We are not passive recipients of treatment. We are the agents of change when it comes to our own health. Things like imagination, meaning, expectation, creating our own healing programs are being shown to have terrific effects for people who have not been helped in other ways. In that regard, I'd just like to share a story with you in closing about somebody who was very sick, whose drugs had not been able to help him at all. And this is what he said. He said, a nurse once told me that I was going to have to take a certain medication for the rest of my life. She kept barraging me with medical propaganda filled with doomsday information. I told her, you put those pamphlets on my bed one more time when I'm sleeping and I'll have you arrested. Instead, John chose his own artistic approach to self-healing. Learning to walk again after his stroke, he refused the hospital staff's equipment. He said that walker was like the scarlet letter to me. Instead, John chose to rely on his sister's shoulder. Recovering from toxoplasmosis, which is a terrible infection of the brain, he invented visualization techniques as a way of buoying his spirits. Quote, I tried to come up with the most powerful thing each person in my family could do, John explains. It's corny, but my mother happens to like doing laundry. So I told her, when you go home to the washing machine at night, imagine you're taking my brain out of my head and putting it in the warm rinse cycle. He said, imagine Toxo coming out of my brain and going down the drain. Then take my brain all clean and fluffy and picture putting it back in my head. He said, his sister loves to cook. So I asked her to picture my brain in her lettuce spinner and spin the living daylights out of it. I thought of the purest, most perfect thing I had ever seen and remembered newborn lambs in spring. I pictured them nestling peacefully inside my head. 
A week after several violent drug reactions, a flummoxed internist paid John a visit. Quote, he told me that the infection in my brain seemed to be gone. The doctor said he didn't get it. It could have been a coincidence or maybe it wasn't. In any case, 30 years later, John Dugdale is still with us. And I believe that it has a lot to do with the fact that he took his own treatment in hand. He used his imagination. He said no to things that made him feel afraid or badly about himself. And he happens to be somebody for whom a healing spontaneously has actually happened. So let's now move into some writing. I'd like you please now to take 15 minutes to write about where you need healing in your own life. Where do you need healing in your life? And how can the principles that I've just been talking about help you in this healing? Be as specific as you can be, please. We'll take 15 minutes to do that, and then we'll come back together as a group. <laughs> 